Good morning. We come in our daily Bible reading to Ephesians chapter 2. And what we're going to find here in the second chapter of Ephesians is one of the most powerful instances of God's grace, emphasizing our desperate condition without God, without his hope, without his son dying on the cross for our sin, and what our state is as depraved sinners, that is, turning away from him by our choice and never being able to come back to him unless God intervened. Thankfully for us, God showed his great grace and his wonderful mercy in the sense in which that we were able to choose by faith, by hearing the gospel message and responding to it, to accept God's grace and to pattern ourselves after Jesus. Now, as we look at the second part of Ephesians chapter 2, you're going to see that that carries some important obligations with it. That God didn't just send Jesus to die for a couple of people or even a certain type or family of people. But rather, Christ died for everyone, or as John would write in 1 John chapter 2, and verses 1 and 2, Jesus died for the whole world. So as we look at Ephesians chapter 2, let's note what our state is without God. Let's be thankful for God's wonderful grace and mercy, and figure out what that means as we go through chapter 2 for our life and how we should look at and view others. Read with me, beginning in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Very rich incredibly powerful moving section of scripture. So let's notice specifically some of the details in these first 10 verses and then highlight what that means as a whole. So specifically in verse one, you were, and who's he writing to? Going back to Ephesians chapter one, the saints at Ephesus, Christians, the church at Ephesus. Okay, so Christian, you were past tense dead in the trespasses and sins. Now, whose sins and trespasses were you dead in? Was it some sort of inheritance? Was it something that you did? Let's see, does he answer? Yes. In verse 2, in which you once walked. Okay, so they were dead in trespasses. Whose trespasses? Well, their own. What does it mean to be dead? Well, <laughs> not alive. And so you can't really do much if you are dead. So this is going to be a problem for us. We're going to be stuck in some ways unless there is something in intervening for us that allows us to come to life. And so in verse 2, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. What does he say? Christians at Ephesus, you once were dead in your sins. How? Why? Well, you walked in the sins that many, if not all of the world, has participated in. Now, this, this, this tracks for us. In Romans chapter 3, and verse 23, the same writer, Paul, would write in a letter to the Romans, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that's important for us to know that we do sin, that we need intervention. And so at the end of verse 3, what were we doing? Well, we were living out the passions of our flesh, the desires of the body, and the mind. That is not what God wants for us. Rather, we were living selfishly. That's what sin generally is. My selfish motivation and desire to do something regardless of how it impacts others, and most importantly, how it corresponds to or stacks up against God's law. That's what sin is, transgression or violation of the law. And so we understand that we are guilty. And this is when God enters the picture in verse 4, but God. What has man done? Sin. Made a mess. Lived selfishly. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. What does man do? Make a mess of things. What does God do? He's rich in mercy. He's also great in his love towards us. His love is great towards us. That's a Powerful statement. The creator of the heavens and the earth loves us so much while we were what kind of person in verses 1 through 3? A mess. At best, a mess. At worst, purposeful enemies of God. And yet God loved us. And so in verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So that is awesome news. We were dead. And what has God done? He has intervened. He has made us alive. Now, the question is, 
who did he make alive and how? Who is eligible and how do we take advantage of it? Is it just something that God thrust upon people? Well, no, because we know some people are going to hell and some are going to be in heaven, which means not everyone is going to be saved. There has to be some sort of condition there. Is it God just choosing from one family? No, we're going to talk about that at the end of chapter 2. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. God struck down that division between the Jews and the Gentiles. So, what is the defining factor then and what allows someone to be saved? If it's not their family, if it's not God arbitrarily choosing, and if it's not everybody in some universal salvation, what is it? Well, verse 6 says, raise us up with him and seat us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we come to verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now, let's properly define this by reading the rest of verse 8. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of work so that no one may boast. By grace you have been saved through faith. What is grace? What's that two-word definition we like to use? Unmerited favor. We do not deserve God's grace. Verse 1 through 3, we were a mess, but God offers, shows grace. Offers, allows us to be made alive together with Christ. How do we do that? What separates those who are saved from those who are lost? How do we get into the body of Jesus where there is salvation and leave the world that's stuck in sin? Well, by grace, yes. We were saved, that's what we want, through Faith. Who determines what faith is? This is an important question. Well, God does. I don't get to determine what faith is. You don't get to determine what faith is. Faith is not only a mental acceptance that God exists, but it is a complete subservience and change of life. Why is repentance so important? Because in verse 1 through 3, we're living for self. We're living to do whatever we want. God says, no, you repent. You turn and now do what I want. You do what your Lord wants. Remember, Jesus is who? Going back to Ephesians chapter 1, the end of the first chapter head of the body, head of the church. We do what the king commands. Grace is God's part. There's nothing we could do to compel him for that. Zero, nada. There's no good enough person. There's nothing. It's God's love, mercy, his pro-offered grace that makes salvation possible. But faith is our part to accept that invitation. There's no power in us living faithfully if God doesn't have grace and send Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sin. But we can have faith that God is faithful to his promises, that Jesus is Lord, and live out what that means. After all, in verse 10, we are, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so we realize we do have a special calling. By faith, it is important to do what God says, to trust in the will and the edicts of the king. So we come to this next section in verse 11. Therefore, on the basis of the salvation and grace that God has offered that you can accept through faith, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to covenants, to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off and been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the Christ, thereby killing the hostility, through the cross, excuse me, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, let's work this in reverse. We all want to be part of the family of God. So what is that? Well, we look at this in verse 20 and 21 in particular. This is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And who is the cornerstone? Christ Jesus. What does it grow into? What's the goal? What is it? We grow into a holy temple. Remember, holy or blameless. What does God want for us? Going back to chapter 1. That we would be holy and blameless in his sight. Now, there's a lot of two becoming one. Two becoming one. Two becoming one. Why is that important? Well, a lot of reasons. Number one, in the new covenant, it's important to know that Jesus died for. God's grace is offered not just to Jews. Not just to the quote-unquote circumcision party, but to everyone. The Gentiles were far off. Does that mean God didn't love them? No. We see from Jonah. We see from other prophets. God cared about Gentiles. They just didn't have the specific law of Moses. They didn't have that connection with God as being his special chosen physical people. But better now, all of us, Jew and Gentile alike, can be God's chosen people. 
And why is that so much better? Read Ephesians chapter 1 again. Read Ephesians chapter 2. And Christ, being a child of God literally now in that spiritual sense, is an amazing treasure trove of blessings that is worth everything, far greater than being physically a children, a child of God. And so as we look at this, what did Jesus do? Well, as we look at verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you who were once were far off, Gentiles have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's always about the sacrifice. We needed that desperately. In verse 14, he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There is no longer anything separating Jew and Gentile. So that's important for two reasons. Number one, we all need to submit to the king. He is king of us all. He is Lord of lords and king of kings. But number two, let me be really careful how I look at others. I, don't, I am not better than anybody else because after all, we all want to be connected with the same Lord. We all want to be sons of God, sons of Christ through faith. And so as we look at being in the family of God, being related in that sense to Jesus, being a child of God, that's so important that we realize we look at others and say, there is a soul that needs Jesus. And if there's a soul that's accepted him, let's pray and be thankful for them. Don't look at anybody with pride. Why is that? Well, because without God's grace, which none of us could compel him to offer by definition and through the plan of God as stated, I wouldn't have hope either. So we need to make sure that we just sow the seed. We sow love. We accept the peace Christ offers and show that to everybody else. In verse seven, 16, excuse me, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the Christ, cross thereby killing the hostility. It's time for divisions of mankind to end, not because God just wants us all to sing kumbaya, but because in the family of God, there should be peace. There should be love, the unity in the family of God. Why? Jesus died to forgive us of sins. What kind of sin? Hating your brother. Living for self. What do we do now? Repenting. What do we do through faith in God? Put God first. Listen to the king. Serve others. Love others. It's amazing what Jesus did. He didn't just die for the Jews. He didn't just die for some good people. He died for the whole world. And so we can't go on living separate lives from everyone else in the sense that I'm better and you're not. We need to be separate if the world is dark and we need to be light. We need to make sure that we realize if there is darkness out there, I need to shine my light. I need to show the invitation of Jesus that he died for everybody and submit my will to his no matter what. I need to repent. I need to realize that I was like the Gentiles, either literally as a Gentile or more importantly, metaphorically, as a sinner. I was far off. But God, sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, allows us to be a part of that wonderful family. That's amazing. That's powerful. What a wonderful blessing to say we can be part of the family of God. Praise God. Thank Jesus. Be thankful for the sealing of and the revelation of the word through the Holy Spirit. And let's live out what it means to be a child of God's today. Let's shine our lights in a world of darkness and dedicate ourselves to God always. I hope you join us on Monday as we study Ephesians chapter 3 and next week as we work through much of the book of Ephesians and reveal more of God's plan, what it means for our everyday life.